Well, thank you for joining us, everyone, and welcome. Uh, it's fantastic to see so many of you uh, coming in. We've got more people um, joining us as we speak, and um, so I'll keep admitting them as they roll in. But it's a pleasure to welcome you all to the fourth webinar in our series on um, emergency food planning. Um, we have been working with the wonderful Kim and Kelsey from um, the Feeding Cities Group, and I'll be handing over to Kim in a moment, who'll be facilitating the session. Um, just to remind you all, we are recording, so um, please turn your cameras off if you don't wish to be recorded, but uh, we also love to see your faces so we can have a conversation and see who we're talking to. So do turn them on if you're happy to do so. Um, we have got a chat function, of course, in Zoom, and we really encourage you to use it. We'd love for you to introduce yourselves and let us know where you're joining us from. And at any point, if you have any questions, please do put them in the chat function. We'd um, really like to, um, to hear from lots of you throughout the session as well. Um, and just to remind you that the, um, the webinar series is part of our Food Cities 2022 Learning Partnership, which is including three webinar series. This is the second. Our first was on creating a food strategy uh, within a city setting. Um, and we also have a learning platform, which um, you can find um, uh, online. I'll drop a link into the chat in a moment. Um, and we've also got a short video to share with you a little later in the session which explains a little bit more about that learning platform but we'd really love um, for you to explore it um, and to use it and to um, hopefully uh, find it to be a really useful resource for the work that you're doing um, within your cities. So uh, without further ado I'm going to um, hand over to Kim. Thank you so much Kim. Thank you Florence. Hi everyone I'm Kim Zuli. I'm the, the founder and the managing director of the Feeding Cities group. And we're the proud partners with um, the Food Foundation and Florence and Shaleen Milu, who's also on uh, working with us on it, and my colleague Kelsey Nordine. Uh, really excited for this presentation. It's the fourth in our series. We have over 80 people registered, I think close to 90, Florence, if that's correct. But because we're global and this is hitting people at all different times of the day, a lot of people wait for the, the recording to come out. They know we record these. So uh, the participate, the actual live participation is a little bit lower than everyone who signs up for it and views it. So just as a reminder of that. Great, Kelsey, if you could. So the motivation for this, really, really simple. Various cities are prepared for emergency food situa situations. Um, they tend to think about relying on NGOs, international organizations, or, the, or their national governments. Um, and they don't have resilient food systems in place either. So we're really hoping with Food Foundation, we're both in this space, really want to push more cities at the city level to be involved in preparation. Great, Kelsey. So when we started to think about how how to ha you know uh, develop a webinar series, think about emergency food for us, we we want to frame it around different causes, different drivers of it, because that leads to different solutions. So we don't think about emergency food as a monolithic item, but we think about what is the what are the different crises. So the first three webinars, one hat was focused on the pandemic, of course, which is top of mind for everyone. Refugees, huge growing situation, really important to think about how to plan for that at the city level. Natural disasters, especially um, growing with climate change and severity and frequency, had a great conversation around lessons learned from Puerto Rico. And this time, so excited for this uh, webinar series, we're going to talk about the drivers of around conflict and smaller cities, but with high growth and what that causes. And then a really great a uh, case study of, of an, an area in Turkey uh, where they have invested in the right way around city and region food systems. And so they don't have a food insecurity problem. So we'll hear about that later. Kelsey, next slide, please. So the learning platform resources that Florence is gonna talk about at the end as well, just an amazing investment by the Food Foundation on this. Uh, really check it out. These live on forever. We've helped curate some resources that complement each of the webinars. And uh, we picked this set for this webinar. We also developed these what we call tactics to try series. So these little case studies, really digestible, 
few pages, um, really something you can try in your city um, or think about what might be similar in your city. And so this year, or for this webinar, we're focused on uh, monitoring and then engagement in Yemen. Kelsey, go to the next slide. So the overview for this, we have uh, four amazing speakers. We have Dr. Faisal Rahman um, from Northumbria and his colleague, Karim um, Samaya from ICAD. And they're going to be talking about two small high growth cities in Bangladesh. And then really fortunate to have Karima Alhada from Yemen, who's going to talk about this multi-sector engagement approach in Yemen, which um, has really been faced with a humanitarian crisis for, for years now. And then finally, the investment I was talking about, great case study from Salim Alpazlan uh, from Izmir, Turkey, and he, he has great stuff. So the, the webinar is short. It's one hour. Uh, we give each of our speakers a very short 10 minutes to talk about their work and each of them could easily have half a day. I know we've spoken to them a couple times already. We could give them easily a day to talk about their work. Uh, would love to travel um, to see them and all of their work. So very short, it's meant as an introduction. So please feel free to reach out to them after and look at the resources to dive a little bit deeper into it. We have one hour uh, for the official webinar and then we leave it open and we stay on and the speakers stay on as long as they can for an additional discussion hour at the end of this. So if you're interested in a more informal conversation, we always have a really lively good conversation with some participants and speakers uh, at the end. Excellent. So Kelsey, wanna... So with that, we're gonna hand it off to Dr. Faisal Ravan. He's now a postdoc research associate with Living Deltas Hub in the Department of Geography and Environmental Science at Northumbria University, but lots of experience doing research in the food system. So welcome Faisal. And we're going to follow this format. It's a little bit of a hybrid. So we're going to pop up his presentation, but I'm also going to ask him some questions. So you'll have something to look at while we're also doing some interviews. So Faisal, sure. if you don't mind sharing your screen. Sure. Thank you, Kim. And hello, everyone. Just please allow me to share my screen. You should, you should have, have that permission. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Lovely. So. <laughs> Faisal, you've completed some very, very interesting research on food insecurity, and some of it we've posted on the learning platform resources. It's focused on high growth smaller cities, which we're excited about because they don't get a lot of attention. Can you tell us about your motivation for focusing on this issue in these type of cities? Oh, thank you, Kim. <clears throat> I think you, as you pointed out in the intro, that uh, we, we focused on smaller cities. Primarily, the reason is that we really don't know what happens in these places but uh, arguably they host the most uh, or the majority of the urban population globally. And many of them are really growing at a speed which is outpacing even the mega cities. Unfortunately, uh, research uh, is mostly focused on larger cities uh, or mega cities. And, and whereas we really don't know what's happening in smaller cities or when we say smaller cities, meaning cities who have, which have population less than 200,000 or 150,000. So one of our motivation was to address this knowledge gap. And, and also the other part, what we wanted to do is to, is to really capture the lived experience in these cities. Now, we, we had a separate project, which, where, which is where we want, tried to capture the lived experience in smaller cities. And then immediately after the project, COVID hit. And that's when we try to really under, uh, understand that, okay, how COVID is affecting the uh, food insecurity or affecting food security in the, those smaller cities. So that's in a nutshell, the motivation that we have. Great, thank you for that. And although you completed, yeah, that's great. Um, love your pictures too. <laughs> so though you completed formal academic research and I do encourage everyone to read, read the research out there, what insights did you gain on how best to monitor food insecurity in cities, especially with hard to reach populations? So uh, I'll, I'll quickly share some of the slides. So, so what, in terms of what we tried to understand, so pre-COVID, 
we looked at, okay, how many, we asked specific questions to population group, which are low income group, but also middle income groups who often do not have guaranteed income. So we covered two groups, low income uh, informal settlement dualists and middle income groups. And we asked them okay, how many meals they take, some of the basic food security types of question, what type of food they eat. And this, is, this one is showing that the two cities that we covered, which both of which are less than 200,000 population, but have experienced enormous growth, or like almost the population has doubled over the last 10 years. So, and we find out that pre-COVID situation, most or at least over 80% or 85% of them were having three meals at best. So, but if, I mean, one might look at this data and say that, well, this is probably pretty food secure, but if you, a food security has several definitions, but, and when we look into the composition of the food, that tells a quite different story. However, when we go for uh, other stuff, so what is, when you want try to monitor, I think one of the two predictors would be income, the other is saving. So what we did is we also asked the groups that we were looking at that, okay, whether how much savings do they have? And, and we find, find out that at least 63% of our respondent had no savings. And, in, and uh, when we asked another question to them that, okay, how much of their income they spent on food, and about more than 50% of our respondents said that they spend over 50% of their income on food. So imagine it's not a rocket science. If, if, you, if you have no saving and then your income drops to zero and before your income dropping, you're spending 50% of your food, uh, of your income on food, then you will suffer from food insecurity. So in my opinion, these are some of the indications uh, or indicators that tell you that, okay, if something happens, then these population group will suffer from food, uh, food security. So savings and income becomes two key indicators in, in, from our experience. And who is most at risk um, in these two cities? Who did you find? So uh, we, we found that, of course, as you see from here, this tells us, so people who do not have savings, but even before savings, what's more important is income. So people who do not have guaranteed income is mostly at risk. Now, what we found out that, of course, the low income groups who often are day laborers or street vendors, they're at risk. Surprisingly, what we also found out from our, uh, from our survey or our work is that it's, it's, there's an invisible group here, which is the low income, sorry, the middle income, but middle income group, which do not have guaranteed income. And sometimes they're often more vulnerable in our opinion, because they cannot access some of those social safety nets or they do not qualify for those. Also, they cannot go for food reliefs that are provided in terms of emergency. So these are the two groups in our opinion, which were affected most from, uh, from the first lockdown, which, uh, for which we were, I mean, we were trying to understand how they were coping uh, with food insecurity due to the lockdown. Great, thank you for that. And so I think I just want to touch on one point that you talked about, which is when you look at what they're eating, if you can go back to that slide where it looks like, um, yes, so there, so a lot are having the three meals, a pretty high percentage, but you, you made a point saying, but if you look at what they're eating, it's, it's insufficient. Yeah. Could you tell us about that? So when we ask them that, okay, what is the composition? So we find out that typically majority of them are consuming starchy food and, and very, I mean, protein is typically filled by pulses or, or uh, lentils. That sort of covers the protein, but uh, very few are um, in taking, in taking animal-based protein or eggs or fish. Fish sometimes, and because of the uh, culture here, people take, do take fish, but, but uh, meat, but hardly they take any meat. And then the other is the consumption of fruits. So consumption of fruits is also low. And then uh, milk, milk or cheese, those kind of stuff, those are almost absent on the, on the everyday diets. So right. uh, from that point of view, I think it's, uh, it's not a balanced diet that they're consuming. Thank you. And that's so important because we'll dive into more into the mal malnutrition side of things um, in Yemen with Karima's presentation later. So finally, just to wrap up, 
what did you learn um, in terms of appropriate interventions? What, what, what insights do you have for other cities? So let me just quickly, before going to the uh, insights, oh, yes. what we found out is that uh, they, I mean, because these group were, groups were suffering from food insecurity, we tried to understand how did they really cope during the lockdown period. We have been able to identify five strategies. These are not innovative strategies. People uh, have experienced or have ex exhibited these strategies in other disasters as well. But in this particular case, they were either storing foods and mostly cheap uh, starchy foods such as rice, lentils or flattened rice. Those are the things they would store. And then the second strategy was that they would either skip meals or curtail consumption and nutrition. And in terms of uh, skipping meals or cutting consumption, most of the time the children would be given priority over other L, L, I mean adults. And if, within adults, it would be the female groups who would then be deprived of, of food or um, most. So there's the gender element there. The other part is that which is very which was interesting, a bit complicated, but also uh, still interesting is that, as I said, that pre-COVID, they were many of them were spending. 50% of their income during food. We found out that, well, while they were suffering from the insecurity, they, I mean, the total expenditure allocated to food increased even 100%. Now, that means that whatever they were earning, whatever small they were earning in the long term, all of it was spent for food. The fourth uh, strategy, we found out that the people were accessing food relief. And the fifth, a very important, is that they were taking loans from neighbors as well as an, uh, uh, sort of neighborhood grocery stores, friends, and even from loan sharks. And in many cases, the interest rates uh, were lowered or, uh, I mean, the micro, micro credit uh, organizations, they sort of gave them uh, sort of a waiver for two or three months on the interest. So these are some strategies they employed to cope with the insecurity they were facing. Now, in terms of coming back to your question, Kim, that, okay, what do we learn uh, or what should be the learning for other cities? So, uh, again, these are emerging lessons. We, have, we don't have adequate data to go through. But what we increasingly find is that a difficult space in urban areas is informality. And this is the, this is the space where some of the most vulnerable groups reside. But, the current governance system doesn't want to engage with urban informality. So therefore existing social safety net programs do not cover a majority of the urban poor. The second bit is empowering local governments. Now we have heard so much of these that are empower and the local government. Yeah. Sorry. Faisal, just, to, just to make sure everyone's clear on what you mean by urban informality, you're talking about the informal housing settlements. Is that yes, correct? That's okay. what I mean. Yeah. So okay. in, I, I say informality because often these slums or informal settlements are established on government property or land. And, and these, there's a, the political economy side of things is that these are managed by often government uh, uh, or political parties that are in power. So the governments typically do not engage with that informality because a, they, they, I mean, these people that are living in those uh, land, they don't have rights to it. So if they want to engage, then they need to see that they have rights. So, but the government or local party officials are benefiting from this. So therefore, there's a gap that everybody knows that these people live there, but in planning or official documents, they're not there. So therefore, <laughs> sometimes it gets very difficult to engage with this group. Yeah. But increasingly, this in the urban science or urban uh, sort of literature, this is becoming a growing issue that, okay, how do we engage with this informality? And, and as I said, the social safety net programs cannot bring uh, or is not working properly for the urban poor, not just in smaller cities, but also larger cities. Right. Uh, coming back, Kim, go ahead. Yeah, no, go ahead. So the second point is empowering local government. So what we see in these smaller cities, which is slightly separate from larger cities, is that these local governments, they have very limited resources. However, the benefit they have is that they are, the distance between their residents of these cities and their local governments is smaller compared to mega cities. So therefore, their governments can act quickly. They can reach out to the, uh, their, the communities or residents much more faster and come up with intervention. So therefore, if you empower local governments or give them enough resources, they could act in a much more coordinated or, or 
uh, what's the word that I'm looking for? I mean, in a, uh, in a way that, in, in an inclusive way. So I think empowering local government is, is absolutely crucial for managing these kind of crises. The third is utilizing and building on the social capital. So as we as I mentioned that one, one of the key strategies was that people were accessing their local neighborhood grocery stores or their friends or their neighbor. So we need to build on that. Okay, how can we come up with the community, sa community savings programs in urban areas? How can we build on those kind of stuff? How can we build on the social capital so that people, if they're of the income uh, or if they're deprived of income for any reason, they can live on those community savings and then can pay, pay off when they are back on right. income schemes. The, uh, so the last right. bit, which was important yes. for us in one of these cities we see is that there's, there's this concept that we see, which is the multi-layering of risk, which is essentially the compounding of risk. So we saw during, while COVID was hit, then there was, uh, people were still under a lockdown condition, then Cyclone Amphan hit these, both these cities. And because these groups do not have savings and to save themselves from this, uh, the storms, they would go to a cyclone shelter and then come back without having anything. So then that led them to go for negative coping strategies such as selling assets. So we need to also start thinking with climate change and other uh, climate change becoming more and more real that, okay, how do these cities cope with multi-layering of hazards or multi-layered hazards because previous disaster risk reduction programs typically focused on one or single hazard mode we need to move away from that kind of modality and Multi start thinking yeah. yeah yeah well thank you so much and Faisal like everyone will have your full presentations posted on the learning platform resource so Florence if you could pull up Samaya's presentation and it's really I mean the research Faisal does is wonderful in its own right and offers so many insights, but we're really lucky to have his colleague Samaya here who's going to talk about the interventions that this research has led to and some of this is in partnership with the food foundation so we'll give uh, Samaya just quick five minutes um, so we're a little over to talk about your work. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Samara Salim and I'm working as the research officer in International Center for Climate Change and Development. And I have worked in. Sorry, can uh, I just jump in, Samaya? Um, we've got a little bit of background noise. I don't, I'm not sure if it's in your, where you are. If you could just make sure you're speaking really clearly into the microphone, just so we can hear you uh, loud and clear. And just shout next when you want me to go on. To so, am I am I am I audible now? In better. Yes, a little too close, if anything. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. Thanks so much. Okay. So, uh, so apology for the background noises. And uh, so I'm working as a research officer in International Center for Climate Change and Development. And I have worked in uh, some projects with uh, Dr. Faisal. So in uh, the uh, in the project that and that is described by Faisal um, Bhai, uh, I was one of the one of the co-worker with uh, him. And uh, I will echo with him in uh, what he he have just said. So as we have worked on this project uh, during the COVID situation, so this is uh, just leading uh, us to work uh, for the small cities for policy development, for the food system, uh, food policy development. So it's just food system issues in regional cities. Uh, we are want to going uh, go forward. So next slide, please. So as we have worked in uh, these two small cities in Bangladesh, which is one of them is Mongla uh, and one of them is Nopara. Both are situated in the uh, southwestern part of Bangladesh. And uh, we have uh, set this, uh, uh, we have uh, took these case study areas uh, for their diversity and people and uh, where their, uh, about, uh, and their uh, location. So both of the cities are very important to our country as uh, both of these are port cities and they're like people come here and uh, to work from other cities. And also people from these cities also go to the other um, areas of Bangladesh and also to the abroad. So we have picked these uh, two areas uh, about, uh, for the diversity. And also uh, about Mongla, and this is, there's a special uh, remark that it's very near to the Shundorbans, which is our mangrove forest and which is our natural savior uh, from natural leaves. So, uh, next slide, please. So, 
uh, why we need the food policies uh, food policies uh, for this cities. So we have um, uh, like, um, there are some reasons behind that. So one of them, them is for tackling the food system challenges, what we have found in our previous uh, research projects. And uh, next is the complex stages of food system. And another is learning partnerships and platforms, uh, what, uh, we, uh, what they, they are in need uh, urgently. So for ensuring safe and nutritious food, uh, we need to reduce the food waste and respond, uh, responding to the global challenge. So we need a food system, uh, food system uh, policies for tackling the food system challenge. On the other hand, uh, we need to focus on the uh, production, distribution, marketing, and consumption because we uh, know that the agricultural land is uh, just uh, uh, deploying in different uh, part of the uh, uh, world and as well as in these uh, two cities. So uh, another thing is uh, we should focus on engaging cities uh, from Commonwealth and beyond. And we, uh, that's why we uh, focus on these two cities. And we uh, also find it important to focus on these cities because these cities are like, uh, as uh, as uh, I have earlier mentioned that these cities are uh, small cities and in some cases uh, from the government uh, perspective or government uh, view for development uh, it's uh, always seen that uh, these cities uh, which are small are not always gain uh, much attention uh, from the uh, central central government so we uh, pick these cities so next slide please so so we found uh, as we have um, and these two cities are very uh, well known to us uh, in uh, in terms of different challenges and their inhabitants and their uh, um, geographical uh, placements. But we, as we have gone through these two cities um, uh, in, for implementing food policies, we found some opportunities and as well as the challenges. So the issues and real scenarios would be um, evident from this area for regional cities, uh, which is an opportunity. Another thing is, uh, uh, if we do further gap analysis and, uh, and uh, further gap analysis, uh, in that case, suggestions can be proposed too. Uh, on the other hand, um, that the first-hand experience uh, of how the system works in real uh, could be identified by us. And on the other hand, introductions to national and international policymakers and agencies to support food policy development and implementation uh, can be done too. Uh, but as um, we, we knew that uh, for every opportunities, there are some challenges. So we, um, in the last uh, in the last month, we have uh, went to the uh, these two cities. So what we have found that, uh, it's uh, sometimes it's very difficult to make the officials understand about what will be their responsibility to work in the idea of food system. Uh, on the other hand, there are like uh, two segments of um, segments uh, of these small cities where in one part the government uh, works in uh, site and in the other part the public uh, uh, public public respondents are in the other side, which is uh, municipality. So there are some clash and there are some tension between these two, um, these two governing bodies. Like uh, it, it's also a challenge to work after managing the tension between municipality and sub district level office. So another thing is um, this uh, tension or sometimes led to the power issues and also the hierarchy uh, uh, issues so we need to focus on that too for implementing this um, to work uh, so hierarchy management is another focus uh, another challenge for us and uh, we all know that the covid situation which is the most important one of the most important uh, fact and problem for us for now so these are the challenges and we also have the opportunities because these areas are very known to us and uh, also uh, we think we can manage the municipality and sub district level office to work together. Great, so, thank you, Samaya. Awesome. Yeah, that is really wonderful. And to cover all that in five minutes, we really, really appreciate it. So, so exciting. I know there's some questions in chat. Um, we need to move on to the next speaker, but we will circle back to these if we have time before we break at the hour, but absolutely after as well. I think um, Faisal and Samaya will be able to stay on for a bit longer. So. Thank you again, Samaya. That's wonderful. And good luck with all those initiatives. 
Um, love to see research driven interventions. So Florence, yeah, if we could, excellent. So our next speaker, and I'm just gonna have Florence, if we could tee up her, her slides as well, Florence, so you can start sharing Karima's slide. Karima, so excited as, as that brief interest said, she's the planning and liaison specialist in Yemen for Sun Yemen, which she'll provide um, some background for. Great. Yes. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Thank so you. So go. So, Karima, I'll, I'll also be asking you some questions as we go through. We know you have a wonderful presentation, but yeah, if you can talk about Sun a bit, your background in Yemen, your current work. Yeah, thank you. So uh, can we go just to the first slide? The next one, please. Yeah, so do you, um, as you know that Yemen slipped into a widespread conflict in 2015, and since then, Yemen is experiencing one of the, the worst humanitarian crises in the world. Um, and as uh, you can see here, there are some of the indicators of the nutrition. Um, at least uh, 20 million of the people are depending on the humanitarian assistance. Next slide. Uh, these are another indicators for the nutrition situation. You can see that a child dies. Um, every 10 minutes in Yemen, and also women and six born, uh, newborn uh, children uh, dies also uh, every two hours. This is just to summarize the whole thing. Next. Um, for the, the cities or the, uh, the governorates as we call them here in Yemen, most of them, um, or we can just simply say all of them have um, um, uh, very alarming levels of ins food insecurity and also malnutrition. Next. So usually for the nutrition actions in uh, protracted crisis, we have both planning, the long and the short planning um, to target the immediate causes and also the underlying causes. So this is the usual framework for uh, targeting the, the nutrition actions. And it, it, uh, usually this can go um, in plans for governorates uh, as a single you know, plans or for uh, the, the whole government as national plans. Next. Um, so this is uh, an introduction about the Sun Movement um, as we are talking about Yemen and all these um, very alarming uh, indicators for uh, nutrition in Yemen. Uh, the, uh, the Sun Movement started in 2010 as an initiative and uh, the first uh, phase of this movement uh, was from 2012 to uh, 2015. Next. The second phase was from 2016 to 22, and now we are experiencing the third phase um, of the Sun Movement, and there is uh, such a huge change in the, the movement um, and expansion in the target groups, and also uh, more focus on the countries and uh, the uh, women and children. Next. It's 63 countries you're in now, yeah, yeah, which is yeah, incredible yes. growth. Yes, this is the, the theory uh, of a change for the, the Sun Movement. As you can see that it depends on a multi-stakeholder, multi-sectoral approach. It means that um, the first step is to, uh, to gather everyone around um, common result frameworks and also to to build the capacity of all these stakeholders to uh, then to mobilize more funds to determine on the actions, to implement the actions and to get the results at the end. Next. Um, for these indicators, Yemen has joined the the movement in 2012 and in 2013, the Sun Secretariat was established in the uh, Ministry of Planning. Next. As you can see that in 2014, we have started developing the National Multisector Nutrition Action Plan. 
and we finalized it at that time actually when uh, the uh, the war broke out in 2015 next you can see that the the you know the situation has uh, deteriorated a lot um the plan that we have developed by the support of UNICEF, WHO, WFP, and FAO was outdated. So we needed to update the, um, to update the, the plan. Next. Um, in 2018, 18, we got the support from the, the Sun Movement uh, to update the, the plan. You can see on the next slide also that we have these two phases uh, for developing the multi-sectoral plan. Um, we, uh, the first one, we finalized the, the CRF, the Common Result Framework, and the second phase, we, um, we done the multi-sectoral plan and the advocacy strategy. Next. So the whole thing about hey, Mar, are you still there? We can't hear you. Krima may have lost connection for a bit. Krima, you may have to drop and rejoin. I think Florence, we can go through her slides while we wait for her. Krima, and this is where we can talk about, um, excellent. So, and Krima, please just shout out <laughs> when you rejoin. But like I've said, we've spoken to Kareem a few times. We have uh, the Tactics to Try case study, which, which dives into her work in the Yeme Yemeni government um, and, and Sun work as well. And if you just wanna go back a bit, Florence, um, right, it's these, it's these five focal points um, in the, in the five ministry, right? They're responsible for collecting data, but a, a key issue with the Yemen situation and other situations like this is it's very dynamic. It's also very difficult to collect data. So that's one of the key challenges is how do you know where food insecurity is? Um, so we, we feature that in our tactics to try. And if you wanna to move to the next slide, the sun engagement, very collaborative multi-sector engagement which is part of their whole theory of change and 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 as part of that they have these different pillars and one of the pillars is the business network which we found really engaging because throughout the webinar series and all of our work when you're talking about chronic food insecurity and the food supply chain most of that supply chain is private when it's a stable thriving food system and so they're engaging it even in a conflict environment they're trying to build up the business network which is the first time it's being uh, built in in such a context so maybe move to the next slide florence while we wait for her to rejoin so we can go through the achievements and lesson learned so the new way of working that she's talking about is that right they really have focused on more access for women's and girls oh are you back on yes Great. sorry Great. i've just been um pretending to be you and walking through a bit of your slides so we stay on time yeah. Um, and yes, giving a bit of background. Great. So if we want, I'll, I'll hand it back to you in this sort of new way of working, which is really great to highlight. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So yes, um, you know, in countries and conflict, usually we have this humanitarian and development and also peace, um, uh, uh, let's say field of working. So um, usually we have this uh, humanitarian to, um, to support the uh, accessibility to um, the people who are suffering from the situation. And then we have this development approach and also the peace um, interventions to um, usually in economic recovery and reconstruction. Next. And, and this is an example of the, the, the development partner um, work uh, that uh, usually they uh, focus uh, to uh, integrate the economic and social development as well as the resilience to uh, shocks and uh, of crisis. Um, uh, you know these slides just for reading next uh, after this um, uh, you know uh, so 
these are the uh, the the on ground examples for the humanitarian development nexus. Uh, so we have for the humanitarian we have the humanitarian response plans, um, usually leaded uh, by the UN agencies in any country, and Yemen is one of them. Next. For the development part, we have this national multi-sectoral uh, action plan uh, with more uh, with focus on the strategic interventions for food security and also for nutrition. Um, this is the theory of a change. As uh, you can see here, we have all the sectors, the wash, the agriculture, the social protection, and if the education, and we have all the, the results and the background. Uh, so it is here for reading for everyone. Next slide. Uh, this is an example of the multi-sectoral and multi-stakeholder um, um, mechanism, how they work together to support the implementation of the multi-sectoral plans. With the, it covers the, the donors, the CSOs, and also the, the government and the national NGOs. Uh, one of the most important uh, networks is the, the Sun Business Network, and we have um, started you know, to work on the establishment phase of this um, business uh, network in Yemen. And these are a few pictures. And also we are working to establish the civil society alliances. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Karima, that was so wonderful. And thank you for staying on time and handling all of those technical difficulties. Again, um, 10 minutes is not fair to cover everything they're doing in Yemen and that Karima is helping to lead there. So please, please take a minute and look at their presentation. It's uh, incredible work in, in difficult situations and, and really leading the field in terms of engaging that private sector, which is great. So thank you, Karima. And now, Salim, welcome to you. Salim and his colleague, Meteb, when we spoke to them, we wanted to move to Izmir. Uh, so they do a great job of talking about all their initiatives. I'm gonna hand it over to you, Salim. And you know, again, we'll sort of interact a bit with some questions, but if you wanna start by just talking about your metropolitan area and, right, I, I, I think you're in the Fertile Crescent. So maybe talk a bit about the food production situation that you're fortunate to, to have there. Yes, yes. First of all, good evening, everyone. And thanks for having me. And yes, we are we are in the fertile crescent, but it is uh, passing uh, just our uh, southeast reg regions of Turkey. Uh, maybe you probably see it from here, from here. And uh, we we are from Izmir, uh, and I am I am working uh, with the Metropolitan Municipality of Izmir in Agricultural Services Department. And uh, first, I would like to. Uh, talk about a little about Izmir uh, and afterwards uh, our uh, potential of agriculture and uh, what we do basically. Uh, Izmir is the third biggest city in Turkey uh, with a population of almost 4.5 million people. We have 30 different districts and uh, 1,300 1, villages and 600 of them are in rural areas. And total land is 12,000 square kilometers. And uh, our agricultural, total agricultural land is 343,000 hectares. And the number of the farmers registered in the Chamber of Agriculture is around 150,000 people. Salim, just a reminder that you're driving your own slides here, so you'll have oh, to yeah. move to the next one. Okay, oh, yeah. great. Yeah, sure, sure. Because I can see the map off to the left there that you might want to. All right. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, now, uh, the land distribution, and uh, it, it, I, I tried to uh, give the numbers uh, with the Turkey um, numbers. Sorry, Salim. Uh, I don't think your your slides aren't updating for us. Are you moving through them? Sometimes uh, this happens where they get stuck. Uh, it, I am on land distribution slide. Ah, uh, no, we're still on the first page. We haven't got the the presentation being shared full screen, and we we're not seeing anything yeah. past the first page. May Okay. Would you like me to? 
Florence, why don't you, Celine? Oh, we're gonna. All right. Oh, there, oh, there we go. That's it. And if you could put it on presentation, that'd be great, so we could get it full screen as well. All right. Okay. Uh, I am at the land distribution slide right now, and uh, these are the Turkey's cultivated area compared to Izmir cultivated area. As you can see from the chart, uh, we we have uh, one point five. Uh, percent of the total farmland in Turkey. Uh, and uh, our farmland uh, is 42% uh, is uh, field crops, 28% is olives, 11% is vegetables, and 10% is fruits. And uh, according to the numbers, uh, we are the number one in Tur Turkey ranking in corn slash uh, because of the animal husbandry. 12% uh, of the total Turkey uh, production, and uh, fifth uh, ranking in potato, and sixth ranking in cotton. And uh, in, yes. Oh, sorry, Salim. Does that mean you are food self sufficient then? Yes, we do. Uh, we, we, we have uh, a really fertile, very fertile land, and we have uh, extended number of fruits, vegetables and also bovine animals, uh, mm -hmm. also sheep and goats. And uh, if we check the numbers, actually, uh, we are uh, number three, uh, around 20 billion Turkish liras. It's around 1.5 billion US dollars. Uh, and in, um, in animal production, number second. And uh, aqua, aquaculture production, number second again. So uh, we are uh, a very lucky city in Turkey. Yeah. We, we have almost everything. Uh, and also vegetables, uh, the five uh, artichokes, spinach, uh, cauliflower, broccoli, and leek, uh, we are the uh, number one producer all over so, Turkey. And maybe just in the interest of time, because we're, you know, this is a very short presentation. Could you tell? Yeah. Could you tell us a bit about the interventions then, the investments you're making through mm -hmm. through the government? Actually, I, I was about to go into oh, okay. those Thank you. on the on the later slide, and uh, you, maybe you can see. Uh, this is our mayor. Can you see it? Yep. Okay, and uh, this is our uh, our mayor uh, is saying another agriculture is possible. So how it is possible? Uh, we plant uh, we plant a different type of an ecosystem, uh, it, which is a circular ecosystem and a sustainable system. Uh, it feeds itself. So it starts with the product planning, uh, and uh, within the agricultural supports uh, such as local breeds, seed supports, feed supports, machines, trainings, and consulting, uh, and afterwards. Purchasing and sales. This is contract-wise production because uh, we, as a metropolitan municipality, we need many crops for social services for poor people, municipality needs, uh, project-based purchasing. So we directly buy from the uh, cooperatives. And uh, also we help them processing, packaging, and branding and sales. And also we do R&D and screening uh, in all these uh, crops. Uh, so it's a, it's a circular system and it feeds by itself. And afterwards, we actually, as the Metropolitan Municipality, we have two uh, major supports. One of them is uh, given out directly to the farmers and the other one is given out to the cooperatives, farmer mm -hmm. unions. So uh, we give out, uh, there are many projects actually. Uh, I would like to uh, go uh, one by one, but uh, it will take a lot of time. Uh, <laughs> may, maybe next time. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we, we give out sheep and goats uh, to, to the uh, people in the villages with uh, no uh, money, uh, no income, and uh, we, without any chance to live. We give out sheep and goats to them and then they have the second chance to live to uh, feed themselves and to earn some money to sell these uh, animals so uh, and, yes. and salim just to provide the right context for the audience because what makes mm -hmm. this so unique is this isn't the national government 
This is yes. the municipal government. Exactly. And and Izmir is the third largest city in Turkey. Is that correct? Exactly. And yes, how that, many that's... how many people are in Izmir? Four point five million people. 4.5 million people and it's this government that's investing in the agriculture around the city so they become this self-sufficient city region food system which you hear a lot about and we're going to hear about in our final webinar series with ruoff and fao but they're actually doing it here mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. really remarkable and maybe you can talk a bit about the challenges that you faced mm -hmm. with that or why your mayor's been able to do that Yes, sure. Uh, you know, there is also central government, uh, which belongs to another party. So uh, they they have uh, many institutions, many uh, corporate uh, corporate ways of uh, doing the, the helping the farmers. But uh, as uh, Albert Einstein said. Uh, the, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. So uh, by saying another agriculture is possible, we are doing some different uh, uh, approaches. Uh, by building that, we are uh, uh, using cooperatives, agricultural cooperatives and uh, farmers. We are working with them uh, pretty close uh, and uh, step by step, we uh, make a, a farm uh, crop into a, a market uh, product. Uh, so during those uh, chain reaction, uh, wherever they need help, we actually uh, support uh, within our uh, abilities. They also, the farmers and cooperatives also get some support from the government as well. But uh, be because of the uh, actually wrong uh, grant policies, uh, th there are some uh, surplus uh, occurred. Uh, for example, uh, let me show you in the beginning, uh, this corn silage, for example, 12% of Turkey's uh, corn silage is produced in Izmir. Uh, why is produced in Izmir? Because there are uh, a lot of uh, bovine animals, uh, and uh, there is also a, a governmental support on this uh, crop. But because of this crop, now one of our major basins have no water because this corn slash is irrigated uh, wildly uh, within this uh, area. And that's why we, we have a uh, lack of water in that basin. Uh, so just because of a, a wrong decision to support a crop, uh, that's, that's, that's one that's of an example. Yeah, that's a powerful example. And Salim, I know, like you said, you could fill half a day um, talking through the, the amazing work that you're all doing. Just in the final minute that we have available, okay. could you tell us some important lessons learned for, for other cities? Sure, sure. Uh, for the, uh, actually, there are some uh, notes, uh, according to the scientists, the total food production is 14 billion people. But because of uneven distribution and losses, almost 2 billion people are in hunger. So we have to decrease the cost of, the co cost of losses. And uh, while uh, decreasing the costs, uh, we have to also decrease the logistics while we are, we are uh, empowering the consumer habits to consume more local and healthy foods because uh, with the indigenous people uh, and family farming, it is the very uh, low carbon uh, produced and very healthy pro uh, products. So, uh, and also you need to be in the field all the time. Uh, that's our uh, success actually came from because uh, all, within all our uh, crew, we are all the time in the field working with the farmers and the cooperatives and uh, with uh, working together 
uh, closely with these people, you can see uh, what else they need and uh, you can see the big picture and uh, what, what piece, what kind of piece is missing. So that's why we are just uh, putting the right piece in that area by using our abilities, such as, as you can see from the screen, people's grocery, farmer's market, uh, R&D center, greenhouses, or seed centers are some examples of what we do. Thank you, Salim. And with that, we do need to transition to Florence. You're, we're going to have a, a quick video from Florence on the learning platform resources. But Salim, I know if you want to drop even more resources in chat here or send them our way, we can also post more. But for those looking for just an amazing example of how the city region food system works, um, Salim and again his his colleague Metab Yildiz, who's on here as well. Met, Metab, maybe you also want to drop your your contact information in chat, but they offer a great story. Florence, I'm going to hand it off to you. Great, thank you, Kim. Um, so interesting to hear these different stories, and I'm, I'm really inspiring. And I'm, I really hope you can all stick around for the discussion because I know there's going to be um, lots of questions um, and lots more uh, interesting um, inspiration and expertise to be uncovered in the next hour. Um, and of course, as Kim said earlier, um, all of these presentations and the recording are going to be shared on our learning platform, which I just wanted to uh, just spend a couple of minutes just telling you about if you haven't come across it. Um, so on the learning platform, you'll find um, a dedicated section to this webinar series with all the accompanying resources, recordings, um, uh, the fantastic case studies that Kim and Kelsey have been putting together. Um, and we produced a short video that um, we'll be we're using to sort of tell people a little bit more about the um, platform at large. So I just wanted to um, share that minute long video with you now. Um, so bear with me while I try and find it here. Um, here we are. Around the world, city authorities are realising the role that they have in redesigning food systems that are healthier, fairer and more sustainable. For those starting out in city food policy, it can be difficult to know where to start and with a wealth of information available, where to look for guidance. That's why we have created a learning platform designed to be an accessible directory of information created with the needs of cities in low to middle income countries in mind in particular. It's a one-stop shop that you can browse to learn about the process of creating and delivering a holistic city-wide food strategy. To consider different areas in which a city can take action. And you can explore our selection of the best resources available. Or use this layout as a way to quickly find information on the specific challenge you are currently working on with case studies, frameworks, and more to inspire and guide you. You can also sign up to our newsletter to keep up to date with news and events. We hope you find this platform valuable in achieving your ambitions to become a healthier, happier, and greener food city. Great, and as uh, you might have spotted on there as well, there is a dedicated tab, as I said, for the emergency food planning series. So please do have a good explore of the platform. We've created it for you guys um, to, to support you in your work. And I'd really love to hear any feedback you have on it as you're using it so we can uh, tweak and improve it as we go. Uh, thank you, Kim, I'll have back to you. Great, and so we are officially adjourned. Kelsey, if you wanna just pop up that final slide we have that moves us into, excellent. So wanna thank everyone, thank our amazing speakers. The very worst part of my job is having to cut them off. Um, I really, as I said, we've spoken to them, you know, at least a couple of occasions and they just have amazing stories to tell and rich, rich information, so please. Um, see their full presentations. We don't give them justice in this uh, quick recap. So we always end on time. That's another one of our promises, which we have. And now we're moving into the discussion hour, which is much more informal. I'll help facilitate that along with Florence and Kelsey and Shaleen. 
And uh, again, this is just that learning platform website available for you. And we will then maybe stop the slideshow presentation, Kelsey, and just move into the Florence, I don't know, you and Shaleen, as I've been moderating, have there been some sort of top of mind questions for speakers that we want to throw out there? Florence, you're on mute. Sorry. So I am. Um, Charlene's post, uh, um, posed a couple of questions. I don't know if you want to jump in, Charlene, um, and introduce yourself, say hello. Yes, I'm happy to. Sorry, there's a reflection here. Um, the sun, we've got great sun today. Um, so I've got questions for each of the speakers, actually. And um, so starting off with Faisal, um, I just need to, to look back what I wrote. Over. Yeah, so empowering local authorities is the heart of the Food City 22 programme. But I was wondering how, um, especially for smaller cities, when you're thinking about how we begin that process, what you would advise. And I know we're going to be working with you closely on this. I'm very excited about that. But what kind of resource do you think that um, officers in the municipal authority actually need to begin this process. And, and can I, shall I, do you want me to ask the other questions or shall I, um, or do you just want to start off with that? Let's start off with that. But Shaleen, Faisal had to leave, unfortunately. Um, he did oh. have a prior commitment, which he let us know, but his colleague Samaya is here. And Samaya, I don't know if you heard okay. that question, yeah. if you would like to respond on behalf of Faisal. Uh, hello, hello, Shaleen. Thank you Hi, for your Maya. question. Yeah, so uh, yes, we have. Uh, I have discussed one of the uh, person from uh, municipality, and I have also shared the uh, shared the document, but in a like more appropriate way, which is uh, which is good for him, not the official document, because I. Uh, don't actually want to uh, we have discussed earlier in the meeting that there are some problems in uh, managing the municipality and the sub district level office so i have just uh, we have just uh, we have a very good contact with the uh, mayor's secretary so i have just uh, informally discussed with him uh, and uh, i have shared the uh, uh, written document with him and uh, he just uh, told me that he will just get back to me after just discussing with who will be the appropriate person and how they can accommodate the plan in their like their office or who will be the responsible uh, person because uh, there's there are many involvement where they're like uh, going to the uh, going to the sessions and sharing their experience so it's uh, up to them actually uh, that who will be the responsible person and how they can make it uh, work so i think and i hope i will i will give you a feedback from him very shortly in the in this week or within next week yes thank you Great. any other questions from the audience before shaleen like she said i know she has questions um for all of the speakers anyone from the audience would like to raise your hand at this point, you can raise it with the, the Zoom reaction hand or your real hand if you want to come on. Okay, while well, people are maybe gathering their thoughts, Shaleen? Yes, I think this is one of um, a really interesting discussion for me. That's why I've got all of the questions. So um, the next question was on this. I didn't quite get the exact term used, but it was on the piece um humanitarian response and actually um we've got a great answer to who the stakeholders are um so but in the midst of conflict which doesn't seem to be easing it's just who are those stakeholders who are the key people that are going to um, make communication um with these key stakeholders easier to ensure that people get access to the emergency food response. So um, Karima did answer in part that um, it would be great to get any more thoughts, I think, on that. Who are the peacemakers in that discussion? Karima, would you like to pop on? I don't know if we can see your face at all. I know there's some. There you go. Yes. Thank you. Um, actually, you know, regarding the um, response in such humanitarian uh, context, the stakeholders varies very much. 
So we have the government um, line ministries like the agriculture uh, sector, the fisheries, the education, the social protection, uh, women in institutions and youth in institutions, also the health sector um, from one side. And we have also the donors, the INGOs or the international organizations. We have also the national NGOs as implementer partners. So usually in such crisis, um, the implementation of nutrition and food uh, actions needs all this uh, stakeholders collaboration together. No one can work alone. And also the action to determine on the action themselves, you need to have all of them on one platform so we, they can decide on the most urgent and the most impactful uh, interventions because you will have um, many competing priorities in such context. So what's the most impactful one? Uh, no one uh, stakeholder can decide this. All of them, they need to agree and to have a space for dialogue. So every time they will have a coordination mechanism like, for example, what we have like the, the steering committee from all these members and representatives. And also we have the humanitarian structure with the clusters, um, which is led by OCHA. So all of them together, usually they work together to decide on actions and also on the implementation. Thank you. I hope this okay. helps. Yeah, it's really good. And just as a follow up, are you finding that through the Sun Network that your own experience is being um, reflected by other similar situations, so Syria, even Lebanon, even though it's not in a conflict situation, is experiencing challenges? But are you learning from other coordinators as well about, or are you finding that each situation is really unique and you've got to treat it like that? I think there is no such uniqueness, you know, in such, in such uh, networks, everyone learning from others. So um, the business network or the CSOs network, um, they have things uh, in common and we learn from each other. And it is a big and global platform that everyone can learn from each other. So there is no such uniqueness that prevent this kind of learning between the, the you know, the national, uh, networks from there and here. So I, I believe that uh, what works, uh, for example, especially in one region like in, Yem in Yemen and Lebanon and Syria, what works there will definitely work here. Yeah, sometimes we have just a slight, you know, localization for these actions, but eventually there is something that is, that's very connected and similarity between these countries, especially when it comes to one region, you know? Uh, so it is so important from my point of view uh, to have this window, um, open window on the regional initiatives and also on the international initiatives. Very important because we learn from each other. The uniqueness is, something that's not a real thing. We need to have, uh, you know, this kind of um, platforms, international and region, regional ones, so we can collaborate and we can initiate initiatives together. Thank you. Thanks, Karima. Shalene, if there are no follow-on questions to that, and again, don't be shy. Uh, this is really informal, so anyone who's joined, please raise your hand vi virtually or visually. And Shaleen, I think you had a, a follow-on question or another question for Salim. Yeah, sorry. I don't normally do this, and my colleagues <laughs> will say. It's true. She doesn't. So. <laughs> I, no I normally sit in the background and just listen in. So um, a great presentation from all of the speakers, and is listening to Isma was just about Ismail was just wonderful um, and we've obviously heard about Ismail through the Delis network as well um, a network of very inspiring cities so um, recently and obviously um, it's always interesting to hear about other countries and what we get through the public news might not necessarily be a reflection of what's going on on the ground but um, there's a program on uh, one of our BBC channels which was talking about food price inflation in Turkey, 
um, and similar to Sri Lanka. And um, I was actually quite sad to think that um, citizens are struggling in, in such a beautiful, incredible food culture, struggling to afford to buy um, fruit and vegetables. And um, some people were saying that, you know, we have to decide whether we can afford to buy, eat a vegetable today. And that they're accused that even um, cheaper bread in, in a country where the bread is just so fantastic. So I was just wondering from, because of Izmir's incredible food system and approach to dealing with um, resilience, whether you've actually been buffered from what's happening in the rest of the country, or, and please tell me off if um, I've, I've referenced a media source that shouldn't be referenced, but yeah, that I, I'd love to hear your perspective on that. Uh, thanks for the question. Yes, uh, it is hard actually. Uh, inflation rates, according to the government agency, is around 31%. And according to some other uh, institutions, it is almost 80%. And uh, because of such an inflation, uh, as the metropolitan municipality, uh, we need to use all kinds of uh, equipments to help uh, the farmers in the ground. So we uh, work uh, really close with the farmers and determine their needs and also the cooperatives, farmer unions, uh, because we have to make them alive somehow. Uh, we, we need uh, them to work in their fields and uh, however, however uh, help needed, we, we are uh, trying to generate that kind of money or equipment by that kind of equipment. So uh, yes, it is hard uh, because of these exchange rates uh, and these inflation inflations, but uh, these kind of uh, things occur in uh, such developed, developing countries such as Turkey. Uh, in the uh, near future, I foresee it will dissolve and then we will have a more stable uh, situations in both economy and agriculture. Uh, and Turkey uh, as a whole, uh, really a big kind of an agricultural potential we have. And we, uh, we, we need to somehow uh, use this potential uh, to, for exports and uh, to uh, feed the country uh, really healthy. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, can I come in with a question for you, Salim, as well? Um, I was interested to, to ask a sort of similar question to um, Charlene in terms of how, um, whether that sort of circular um, local food economy um, really proved um, to, to be a sort of, um, to provide resilience through the COVID crisis, and also whether um, the prevalence of having such fertile region and having such a prevalence of food growing means that more of the citizenship are engaged with food growing. Do people grow themselves at home? And did that provide resilience to shocks um, through either through COVID or through, um, through the inflation um, increase? Uh, actually, in Izmir, uh, we have uh, small scale farmers all around. Uh, areas are scattered and uh, relatively smaller uh, than the mid Anatolia farmers. Uh, so uh, I can say there are many uh, small scale farmers and we encourage them <clears throat> to empower uh, under a cooperative so that we can uh, help them uh, and uh, make a bridge between a cooperative and the metropolitan municipality and uh, buy directly our needs from metropolitan municipality and uh, make that bridge more resilient in uh, such cases like COVID. And in uh, COVID, uh, during COVID in 2020 and also 2000 last year, uh, we do not uh, really feel uh, the lack of vegetables or uh, fruits because all the farmers 
uh, are doing their 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 work in their fields. So uh, we are we really have close relations with them because of the fact that we are all the time in the field with them, and that's why uh, we do not have uh, that kind of a shortage uh, occurred. Uh, but uh, we understand them well, I can say, uh, and we are all the time working together with them. And in case uh, uh, purchasing or some kind of a need of, an, uh, of a, a metropolitan municipality, we directly buy from them. So that's why uh, they, 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 they get relieved because of that help. Great, thank you. There you go. Great, thank you, Salim. That's wonderful. There been any any other questions in chat, or would anyone else like to ask a question? So, quite a few people online. Please don't be shy. Also, can enter it in chat. Shaleen was asking a follow-on question on cooperatives, which is very interesting. In uh, my former career, I actually led the Center for Cooperatives at the great University of Wisconsin in Madison um, in the US and did a, a you know, not, not only my dissertation on production cooperatives, but a lot of work with different types of cooperatives and can tell you internationally, uh, they're incredibly important um, and resilient food systems. Anyone wanna add anything on cooperatives? and the role they're playing in their cities or any questions about cooperatives. Okay. Salim was I just mean, mentioning. Um, yeah, go ahead, Shaleen. Kim, we uh, partner with a city um, in India called Pune, and um, we met one of the very senior uh, municipal officers who comes from Pune is in a state called Maharashtra in India, which is almost very much a breadbasket type state and um, farmers are struggling and so what he did was he set up through the cooperative movement which is very well established in India um, a local farmers market to service um, they have big societies complexes where hundreds maybe even thousands of middle class families live and they brought the, the farming produce to those societies and um, the municipal authority is now rolling out a program of farmers markets across the city, which is um, being done over the next couple of years. So uh, I think it would be really interesting to learn from Pune, Islia and others in a separate cooperative session about how we can protect producers and also make it easier for um, consumers to get to fresh produce easily and be buffered against um, kind of the macroeconomic, like the, the food price inflation and supermarket related issues. So yeah, I think it would be really exciting that session. Yeah, and I can say there's just a, you know, the cooperative infrastructure and part of the cooperative movement, which is, you know, very old um, and global, that there are lots, there are just amazing resources and infra infrastructure out there, which maybe Salim, I'm sure you can attest to as well, but, um, they're just amazing experts uh, that you can plug into uh, who work with cooperatives and really understand um, all of those issues. That would that would be great to think about a webinar with on on that topic in the future. What else is on people's mind as you as you heard from these you know a, a rich array of speakers and and topics? We went from conflict to uh, sort of a fertile crescent situation and developing that robust city region food system. Any questions? Anyone wanna share what they're doing in their city? Why group today, Florence and Chalene? And this is not. Stefania is on from C40, I see. Stefania. Would you like to just say hello? And you're in a mass, so you must be in a public area. So you might not be able to speak. Not really, no, but I can speak. I can speak. Hi, everybody. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, nice to be here with all of you. Uh, very 
curious to uh, hear more about the, the discussion. Sorry, I joined later, I was in a different call before, but happy to be here. Great. Well, nice to nice to see you online. We had Barbara Emanuel, who also works with C40 and us uh, on this, and she just dropped. Um, great. Well, if there are no further questions, I don't know, Florence, do we want to sort of wrap it up? I know we're going to stay online a bit just to for a quick debrief. If we can keep this open, but any, anyone else? Otherwise, we are going to thank our speakers. The the final one staying on, Salim and Metap. Metap, maybe you can come online just so we can see you once more. Ah, Metap, thank you. Hello. Met, Metap has been instrumental in arranging this and uh, being so responsive to us. So really want to thank you for all of your support. Uh, I also like to cooperate with you. I uh, listen to all the speakers with great interest here. We also learn a lot. But as Selim, uh, my colleague, mentioned that uh, the agriculture developments are the, the main focus of our mayor in our uh, region. Amazing. Amazing. Uh, just a wonderful example that we will continue to feature throughout, for sure. And uh, Salim, thank you for your engaging presentation and for you know fitting it into ten minutes. Salim has, I, I think it's like fifty slides he originally showed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's got. <laughs> he has a maybe very, next time. <laughs> maybe next time we need a full yeah. hour devoted just to Salim's presentation. Oh, so yeah. Salim, well, thank you for tailoring it. Thanks you, thank you as well. And experience sharing is so important. Uh, thanks for uh, giving us a chance to share our experiences and learn from experiences all over the world. I think we need to expand it a little bit furthermore, uh, according to subjects and also uh, some different uh, countries as well. So uh, we need to learn from everybody. That's right. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, so thank you both. And Samaya, thank you for sharing in Bangladesh. You know, it's early days there. And if you want to jump back on, if we can see your face again, just to say goodbye to you, you might not be able to. Uh, everyone on the webinar, you know, just to, it, it's incredible that everyone's willing to share in English, uh, manage uh, the technology, sometimes difficult connection situations, um, and do it at all hours of the day. Yeah, so network is troubling in Samaya. So Samaya, thank you, and thank you for agreeing to join. I uh, really appreciate it. Thank you for, for all the participants today. And with that, I think we will, we will end the webinar. Florence, we'll just keep it open for our team. Great. All right. Thank Thanks, you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. See you next time.